Good morning, Dearborn Baptist Church and guests. Welcome to worship. The psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And that is uh, how we should come, the spirit with which we should come into worship today with just joy and gladness in our hearts that we are uh, thankful and, and able to praise God and thank him, recognize his worthiness of our praise and be grateful to him. And I'm so happy to welcome you and glad that all of you are here today. Um, we'd like to mention that if you are a guest of Dearborn Baptist Church, particularly if you are a first time guest or even if you're not a first time guest, if you're a returning guest, but you've never taken the time to fill out our connection card located on the uh, a little pocket there, please, uh, if you would, take the time to do that. We won't harass you with the information. We want to help you and we want to get to know you. We want to thank you for being here. And uh, so we just would encourage you to do that and put it in the offering plate that is uh, in the uh, foyer. A little bit later on, uh, we will be praying, but I, while I'm up here right now, I want to just mention special prayers for my family this week. Uh, my mom is having surgery uh, this week, so pray for her, that surgery. She uh, goes to the hospital Tuesday for labs, and then the surgery is supposed to be on early Thursday morning. So please remember Ima Jean Sparks as she has a uh, heart valve replacement surgery on uh, Thursday. She's had a really bad day yesterday and uh, I don't know what's going on there, so keep her in your prayers. We've been praying also for Zhenya. She was out of the hospital as of Friday, and uh, the way forward is undetermined right now, but please continue to pray for, uh, for Zhenya. And maybe you may hear some more requests a little bit later on. Right now, let me mention some things that are in the bulletin. Um, I have one announcement from the bulletin to mention. And that is right in the middle there. Uh, not only the announcement of that, but the clarification of that. Our new uh, chairs will be arriving this Thursday morning. Timing is not great for help, but uh, 300 chairs are going to be delivered here about 8 a.m. on Thursday morning. They have to be moved from the truck into the building. If you are available to uh, do that, if you can make yourself available to do that, that would be very, very, very helpful, especially young, young, strong men that could uh, help us do that. They come wrapped in uh, stacks of 12, and uh, that each stack weighs 240 pounds. Obviously, that's impossible for one person to pick up and move in. We'll have to take those apart. We do have uh, some carts that we will put them on to bring them in here, I think. So, uh, but we certainly could use your help. And then the following week on Monday, the pews will be coming out and the, the carpet layers will be laying the new carpet on the floor of the auditorium and before we put the new chairs in. So we're going to need some help again on Monday the 15th for uh, uh, the pews being moved out of here. That's a big uh, need. And uh, so I hope that you will help us if you possibly can. We have a couple of other announcements in the bulletin. If you, uh, if you haven't picked up a bulletin on your way in, you probably got one handed to you. But if not, on your way out, make sure that you uh, get that just to keep up with church life. A couple of our ladies are going to share uh, a couple of those announcements. Uh, Elizabeth, start us off with the uh, PCC walk. I hope you all can join us. Um, it will be May 3rd. Registra registration starts at 5 o'clock until 6, and the walk starts at 6. I hope you all can come and join us. And on the table out there, there's a walker registration form, and then where you, the donation form is out there. And then we have what you can earn with the prizes. If you raise 200, you get a t-shirt, chapstick. Raise 500, t-shirt, chapstick, cell phone stand. 
and you raise a thousand, you get a t-shirt, chapstick, cell phone stand, an umbrella. And I got to model the umbrella the other day. It was really sweet. <laughs> um, so, um, and then also for the Walk for Life, we're doing an art and essay contest. So you could pick out the, pick up the information for all the kids out there, um, out there on the table. Thank you. I hope to see you at the walk. Lori's going to also make an announcement. A couple of announcements. I got three. <laughs> Okay, so the first one is for the ladies retreat. The retreat is May 24th and 25th. The money is gonna be due by next Sunday. Um, if you have questions with that due date, get with uh, Carla or Carrie Liss. Um, you can pay that, um, the amount, the first 60 that's due online or in person. Um, just reach out to Carla, Carrie, I think Tracy um, is also available to take any monies. Um, so if you have questions on that, uh, reach out to Carrie or Carla, but the money is due by next Sunday, online or in person. For my second announcement, we are still working on decorations for VBS on Saturday mornings. One thing that I'm gonna do is make some bags so that you can take some of the decorations to make home. They're very easy. We're making the church look like a, look like a jungle, basically, so we need lots of um, vines and leaves and stuff. Um, so that ties into my request is we do need some help with donations for making the decorations. We need like brown paper bags and green construction paper to be able to make these decorations. I have my um, little cards that tells you exactly what it is that I need. I'll have them out here on the table for you if you could pick one or two or however many you want. I'll have some instructions on what we're using the decorations for so you kind of understand like how much we're needing. One of the vague ones that are gonna be on my sheet out there is we are in need of mayonnaise jars for a bug collector that the kids are gonna be making. Um, it's like 32 ounces, 40 ounces, so kind of like the bigger ones. The most, I have mayonnaise jars on there. The most important thing is, is that the jars need to be smooth on the outside, not ridged, so that the kids can like see their bugs that are in the jars. So whatever empty jars, just bring in the empty jars that you have. Um, it's kind of harder on that to know exactly an account because we don't know how many kids we'll have. Um, so I will just say stop as you're bringing in the jars when I have enough. And then the last announcement I have is for Rangers. We're going to have our church-wide camp out on April 26th, so at the end of the month, back at the shelter house. It was a lot of fun back in the fall. If you were kind of on the fence of coming and seeing what Rangers about or if you have kids that are kind of interested, this is a great time to come and check us out and see what we're doing. And we have games. Uh, hopefully, we'll have a bonfire. Um, it's been pretty wet, so I don't think that'll be a problem this time. Um, but come out, and I'll have more information um, as the weeks go on for um, sign-ups and anything with that. So if you have any questions, just reach out to me or uh, Kim and Ryan Thompson or Kelly and Kathy Sebastian for any information on the camp out. Um, the Vollmers, too. Um, we can all help you out. All right, thank you. All right, so eat lots of mayonnaise. It will help VBS. That's what I heard, right? <laughs> Let's stand together, say hello to someone, make a new friend, and uh, take just a moment to greet one another. And when you uh, see Matthew up here, get ready to sing praises to God.
let's get ready to sing. give thanks with our hands today for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's give God a good hand. Amen. Now you can be seated. Get your Bibles if you would. And to, turn, if you would, with me to Luke chapter, Luke chapter number 24. In fact, Luke chapter 23, we're going to be reading, beginning in verse number 46. Luke chapter 23 and verse 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, <clears throat> he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion <clears throat> saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, 
Certainly this was a righteous man. And all the people that came together to that site, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. And all of his acquaintances and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off, beholding these things. And behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and just. The same had not consented to the counsel uh, and deed of them, and he was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. This man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus, and he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone, wherein never before was a man laid. And that day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew on. And the women also which came with him from Galilee followed after, and behold, the sepulcher and how his body was laid. <clears throat> and they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. In other words, they were going to go back the next day on the first day of the week to finish preparing the body of Christ. So we come to verse number 1 of 24. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepare, prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of Jesus Christ. We'll pick that up in the message in verse number four. But what a great passage of scripture about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And really that's why we're here on Sunday. Every Sunday that we meet, we celebrate the raising of Christ from the dead. Amen. And so let's thank him in prayer. As we pray for those perhaps that could not be here today, that the Lord would touch them uh, and that God would bless us in our service today. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. And as we come to you in prayer, as we begin this service, Lord, we've greeted each other and we have sung and we will sing again. But Lord, now we pray. And Lord, indeed, this is one of the greatest, one of the greatest tools that you've given us as Christians is the ability to speak to you, the ability to pray. And we're thankful for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> As a result, we know that he's on the right hand um, of the throne this morning, making intercession for us. And Lord, literally, he, he is the bridge between us and you, Father. And without his coming, without his crucifixion, his death, burial and resurrection, our talking to you today would not even be possible. You would not hear us. Our worship would be in vain. But because of the resurrection, we know that our Savior lives and we worship you and we praise you today and we praise him and we're thankful that we can be saved and that the Holy Spirit can be in amongst us and to live in our hearts. And we pray that he would move today among us. And as we open up the scripture in just a moment, and as we sing and as we worship, that the spirit would move and work. And if there's one person today in the hearing of this message, in the hearing of the word, that God, that they would be born again. We ask you, God, to draw them to yourself. Convict them of sin. Convince them of the righteousness of God. Christ, and that they would receive that for themselves. We ask you, God, to bless those that cannot be with us today. We think of Jania and others. Lord, uh, Jania, with her cancer and the treatment that she's taken, we just really pray, God, that it would be extremely effective and that the cancer, every cell of it, would be eradicated from her body. 
And Lord, for those others that perhaps we are not thinking of that cannot be here today, we pray that you would intervene in their situations and in their life. And God, that you would raise them up and that you would bring them back very, very soon again. And so God, we take this service and we place it in your hands. And we pray that you will receive all the honor and the glory. And God, we come to you with great confidence that our prayers are being heard. And we thank you ahead of time for the way that you will answer. And we ask it all in Christ's name. Amen.
this time, our children are dismissed to Children's Church. Because he lives, I can fish tomorrow. Sorry, Jeff. Because our Redeemer is faithful and true. As I look back on this road I travel, I see so many times He carried me through. If there's one thing I have learned in my life, my Redeemer is faithful and true. My Redeemer faithful and true My heart rejoices as I read the promise There is a place that I'm preparing for you I know one day I'll see my Lord face to face Cause my Redeemer is faithful and true My Redeemer is faithful and true Everything He has said He will do And every morning His mercies are new He has proved His love for me When I lack the understanding He gives more grace to me My Redeemer is faithful and true Everything He has said mercies are new my redeemer is faithful and true my redeemer is faithful and Thank you so much, uh, Jr. That's really faithful and true, isn't it? That Jesus rose from the grave. You know, he told them before he died that he was going to rise. They had forgotten that, hadn't they? But he did exactly what he said he would do. And he still does that today. Get your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me back to the book of Luke, chapter twenty. Four, Luke 24. We'll read from there in just a moment. You know, we've just come through actually the most important holiday, or actually we should call it a holy day of the year, and that is Resurrection Sunday, last Sunday. The most, most important thing that we celebrate. When you think about it, it's really an amazing thing 
that the greatest news to ever hit planet Earth came out of a cemetery. Somebody would say, well, really? Yeah, really. Jesus Christ is risen from the grave. In Luke 24, very early that Sunday morning, as the women came to the tomb to finish a proper burial for Jesus Christ, when they got there, the, the tomb was empty. But there were two industrial strength angels that were there. In fact, it just about scared the ladies to death as they hit their faces. Do you remember the question that the angels asked the women? Let's read it. Beginning in verse number 5, they said, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee? Verse number 7, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And right there they remembered the words. They thought, yeah, he told us that, didn't he? If you would go to the book of Matthew, which we won't do that, I like what the Bible says that these ladies did when they got that message from the angels. And of course, Luke tells us that they went back to the apostles to tell them that Christ is risen. But I love the way Matthew tells it. He says, with fear and joy, they ran as they left the tomb. They were so excited to go tell the apostles. And my friends, since that morning... Nothing has ever been the same. The, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ literally changes everything, does it not? The resurrection of Christ set the disciples and the church on fire. In fact, that's why I've given the title. If you looked at the front of the bulletin before the service, you may think that was a little interesting or kind of funny. I called it the afterburn of resurrection. Because it just set the people on fire. In fact, does anybody know? This is what I was thinking of. This is actually what I was thinking of when I thought of this tile. Does anybody know what an afterburner does for a jet plane? It's, it's a device that is on the back of the airplane where, where the, the red hot exhaust is coming out. And that device... When the pilot, when he switches a switch, it begins to inject jet fuel directly into that flame, and it actually increases the thrust of the engine by 50%. You've got to understand, I'm kind of a mechanical guy. You know? I think of illustrations like this. And literally, when the pilot kicks in the afterburner, um, it increases the power of the airplane so much that they will go into speeds of Mach 1 and some planes even into Mach 2. Well, the resurrection of Jesus Christ was like that for the church and for God's people. The disciples thought that everything was over. That their Messiah, and think about this, in the flame of the hope of their future was just put out. But when Christ rose from the grave, the reality of His resurrection produced such joy, such excitement, such devotion in the disciples that the afterburn of it launched them into the world with the great power to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, nothing could stop them. The Bible tells us that they went everywhere preaching Jesus, and in their generation, they turned the known world upside down for Jesus Christ. And those women, as they ran back to tell the apostles, they were experiencing the afterburn in their hearts of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What a great message that was last Sunday that we had that Daryl preached about the resurrection of Christ. 
Today you might think, well, this is a little bit redundant, but I want to tell you today that this is probably going to be the last time um, that I will probably get to preach a message on the resurrection as a pastor. And it's one of my favorite subjects, so you'll just have to bear with me because I'm going to do it. And actually, we're going to look at the things that took place after the resurrection. Not only were those women just thrusted forward by the res resurrection of Christ, but there were two other people that Luke talks about in chapter number 24. Um, in fact, one of them's name was Cleopas. And it was the third day, and they were walking to him. And, I, and really, I think that the second person, I think there's reason from the Scripture to think that the second person that was walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus was probably Cleopas' wife. And they were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, where they lived. And they were walking with sadness. And by the way, it was seven and a half miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. You know, it's hard enough to walk seven miles, let alone being struck with the greatest disappointment that you'd ever felt. The Bible says that Luke shows up, that Jesus shows up to walk with them. Now it also says that their eyes were withheld from seeing that it was Jesus. Here they were walking and talking with Jesus and they didn't know it was him. And he asked them the question, why are, there, why are they sad? And they said, you mean you don't know the things that have taken place in Jerusalem? And Jesus asked, well, what things? And he said, the rulers have crucified Jesus. And we thought that he would be the one that would redeem Israel. But now, now it seems to be all over. And in verse number 25, pick up the narrative there. In verse number 25, Jesus speaks up. Now, realizing that they don't know that this is Christ. And he's, but he says to them, O oh, fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And he kind of chided them. In fact, that was kind of similar to what the angels said to the ladies. You know, they asked the question, why do you seek the living among the dead? In other words, it's prophesied. In fact, did he not tell you while he was still in Galilee that he was going to be crucified and raised again? And they remembered. And Luke says that Jesus began to expound to Cleopas, and whom I believe to be his wife as well. And from the books of Moses, which are the first five books of the Old Testament, and all the prophetic scriptures that speak of messianic fulfillment, Jesus began just to quote scripture and passage after passage as he walked with him on the road to Emmaus. And my friends, it was a seven and a half mile Bible conference. Can you imagine what they thought of this guy? We don't know who this guy is, but he sure knows the Bible. As he quoted and he quoted and he spoke of scriptures and he pointed out prophecies and he was telling them that all of these things that you just Witness that happened in Israel that was all intended on happening. God has got this entire situation in hand. And when Jesus finished with all the Old Testament scriptures, they had arrived for their de to their destination there in Emmaus. And the two disciples still didn't know who he was. But they invited him into their home to eat with him. And as they sat down... The Bible says that Jesus took the food and the bread and he broke the bread. He prayed over it and he began to hand it out to them. That's just like Jesus, isn't it? Let's read it in verse number 30. Verse 30. And it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and he blessed it. Now think about it. They've got their heads bowed and their eyes closed. And Christ is praying over the food. And when they raised their eyes up as he was passing it out, their eyes were opened. Look at it, verse 31. And their eyes were opened and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. Just, whew, he was gone. Can you imagine what that would have been like? Can you imagine 
the fear. Could you imagine the excitement? Can you imagine what they thought? Now, here's the afterburn. Look at verse number 32. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us, by the way, and while he opened to us the Scriptures? And their heart burned within them. You know, just thinking about it as I read it today, and surely you're thinking this too, that our hearts still burn within us when we read about and we hear the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, I can feel underneath the sleeves of my coat, the hair is standing up on my arms. Because it's true. It's true. Christ has risen from the dead. Now think about it. They would have to be tired after walking seven and a half miles. But notice what they do in verse 33. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem. They were so fired up that they walked all the way back to Jerusalem. Fourteen, in fact, 15 miles all together. And don't you know that the walk back was completely different than the walk to home? No sadness. No disappointment. No longer is there disillusionment. The pit that was in their stomach has been replaced by relief and joy and excitement and expectation. And the burn of it is continuing even today in our own hearts. Now listen. The good news just literally crushes the bad news of life. The good news that Christ rose from the grave. There's a passage in Hebrews. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it to you. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, 28. Verse number 27 really shares the bad news with us. And it's this. That is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. That's the bad news. Let me tell you what. Every person, every one of us in this building, we are going to keep that appointment Every one of us will have to stand one day before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ and we will give an account of what we've done in our bodies, whether it be bad or good. Not only those that are saved, but those that are lost will show up two different judgments, the Bema seat for the Christian, the white throne in the far far out distance future for those that are lost. But everyone, and because of our sin, the Bible tells us, That it is appointed unto men once to die. And after this, the judgment. That's the bad news. But here's the good news, verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him. Now look at this. Think about this. And unto him that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. What is that saying? Well, if he's going to come back the second time, that means he had to raise from the grave, right? He's no longer dead. He is seated on the right hand, and there's coming a day where the Father will reach out, and I don't know whether he'll tap Christ on the shoulder or how he will let him know that, son, it is time for you to go get our children. And Christ will step into the clouds. The trump of God will sound. The dead in Christ will rise from their graves first. Then we which are alive shall be caught up together with them in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And God is keeping his promise. You remember Jesus before he left the earth? And they were concerned about him leaving. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am there, you may be also. And my friends, he's going to keep that promise. How can he do it? Because he's alive. Because he is risen. And verse 28 says that, they, that we are going to look for him. And he shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And my friends, after 2,000 years, the afterburn still burns within us. Because he lives, we look for him. But you know, there are some people that would ask... But how do we know that the Bible is true? I mean, after all, 
the Bible, it's, it's, it's a religious book written by religious people who could have just written what they wanted to please their own religious interests. How can we really believe that what the Bible says is true? Now listen to me. The veracity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the biblical account of the birth, the life, the death of Jesus Christ has been looked at by so many people and tested and doubted and researched that it has been proven to be true. And it might be interesting to you today that outside of the Bible, there are some 39 other ancient texts from the 1st and 2nd century written by Jewish and Roman and Greek historians that those guys questioned all of this stuff, like the resurrection. And when they looked into it and researched it, and they did interviews with people, they too came to the understanding that what the Bible says about the resurrection of Christ is actually true. Men like Josephus, Ignatius, Tacitus, see if I, I can pronounce this one correctly, Suetonius, Justin Martyr, Clement of Alexander, and many, many others, and some of these people were actually contemporaries of the time that Christ died. And they wrote down eyewitness accounts of people who had seen the resurrected Christ. Consider one, Josephus. Josephus was a Jewish man. And he was hired by the Romans to write history down that an accurate account would be kept of what took place during the time that they controlled over that area of the world. Josephus actually interviewed people who had witnessed the resurrected Jesus. Let me read one of the accounts that he wrote. About this time, there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. For he was one of one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of those who accept the truth gladly. He won over many of the Jews and the Greeks. Now listen to this. This is Josephus saying this. He was the Christ. And when upon the accusation of the principal men among us, Pilate had condemned him to a cross, and those who had first come to love him did not cease. He appeared to them spending a third day restored to life. For the prophets of God had foretold these things and a thousand other marvels about him. I love this. And the tribe of the Christians, so called after him, still to this day, have not disappeared. You know, when I read that, in fact, when I read Josephus saying that he was the Christ, I begin to wonder, well, did Josephus get saved too? We may just meet him in heaven. And my friends, here we are today. We are a part of that tribe, aren't we? And, Christ, and Christ's tribe today is literally all over the world. Why was why is the message of the of the gospel so powerful and so prevalent and so great in terms of bringing people to a saving knowledge? My friends, it's because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself told his disciples before he left the earth in Matthew 24, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. He then gave them the Holy Spirit and gave them the great commission. And he told them, you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And Jesus' word about the future is happening even in our time. Do you know that there are many, many thousands of people that are being saved around the world every day? I've heard testimonies 
of those that work in covert ministries in nations where Christianity is not allowed and where they still go in. For instance, in the nation of Iran, of Iran the number one state sponsor of terrorism in the world. Christianity is, is forbidden there. But there are those that are giving testimony that literally millions of Iranians are receiving Jesus Christ as personal Savior. What is it that makes the gospel of Jesus Christ so powerful? It is the resurrection. And my friends, it's the afterburn. The means of the ministry is the Word of God. The power of the ministry is the Holy Spirit. And my friends, when it is shared and when it is sent by all the different ways. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that we, we would have never thought that we could share the gospel through a cell phone. And that through the internet and through websites. In fact, there was a guy in Iran, an Iranian man that began to win people to Christ so powerfully that they kicked him out of the nation. Uh, uh, and he's been called the Iranian Billy Graham. But from outside the country, with his cell phone and with his computer, he is still winning people in Iran to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, Satan doesn't like it. And over history, <clears throat> he's tried to stop it in any way that he can. And one of the ways, he inspires men to write books to disprove the resurrection. And there have been many of them. Let me tell you a couple of stories. A guy by the name of Robert Ingersoll. In the late 1800s, he was a, um, he was a politician and an orator. And he was an atheist. And everywhere that he went, he did his best to discourage people from believing in the Word of God and from believing in Jesus Christ. He had a friend who was an, a general in the, the Civil War. His name was Major General Lou Wallace. And Lou Wallace was a very capable man, very educated. Um, and Robert Ingersoll convinced him to write a book. What you need to do, he said, you need to take time and write a book that disproves the resurrection of Christ. And he said, I'll do it. And so he began to research and to write. Well, he had a wife that was saved. And when he began to research and write, she began to pray and have faith. And when, when Lou Wallace got to the fourth chapter, God answered her prayer. And he had an encounter with God, and, and it was so because the research that he was doing about the resurrection of Christ, that every aspect of it that he looked at, he said, this actually happened. And he received Jesus Christ as Savior. And my friends, that's happened to many. Um, I think of uh, a guy by the name of Albert Henry Ross wrote a book that is still very popular today. An atheist, he decided, I'm going to write against the resurrection. But it wasn't very long till he changed the direction of the book and it became a book to prove that the resurrection was true. And it's called, Who Moved the Stone? In fact, if you go back to, to General Wallace... He actually continued to write his book as well. But it was no longer a book against the resurrection. In fact, he continued uh, and wrote a fictional book about a man that lived during the time of Jesus and his struggles in life. And how that he witnessed the crucifixion of Jesus and became a believer and in 1952, they took the book and made a movie, one of the great epics. You know the name of the movie. Don't you? Ben-Hur. And to this day, it's my favorite movie. Every year about this time, Ruth and I take two nights. We used to watch it all in one setting. It's a three, over a three-hour movie. We used to be young enough to watch it all at one time. Now we do it in two nights. And it used to be that Hollywood would make movies like that, but they, they don't any longer. In fact, if they try, they almost always mess it up really badly. But there have been people like that. Think about this guy. 
There was a young fellow who was in graduate school that was really, really sharp. And his fellow students said, you need to write a book disproving that the Bible is true and that the resurrection didn't happen. He said, I will do it. And so he actually took time off from school and went to Europe for several months and began to write. And the more that he researched, he realized that the resurrection happened. His name is Josh McDowell. And instead, the book that he wrote became evidence that demands a verdict. In the 1980s, there was a lawyer and journalist by the name of Lee Strobel. His wife had gotten saved, and he did not like it. She became a strong, witnessing Christian, and he felt that it was so interfering with their family's life that he decided he was going to write a book that proved to her that Christ was not real. And so he set out to write the book, and he traveled all over the country. And he interviewed... Um, professors and preachers and he became convinced that Christ had risen from the grave and the book that he had been writing was changed and then it became the case for Christ and as a result many people have been saved as a result of what he's written it just kind of seems that if you want to quickly come to know in a hurry and meet Jesus Christ just write a book in criticism of his resurrection In fact, Jesus cannot be stopped. When you have, now think about it, when you have the power to take up your life so that you can raise from the grave, who can stop you? And I tell you what, today we ought to praise God that He loves all of us if He's got that kind of power. The Bible says that He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to, to repentance. Because think about it. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us today deserve to be separated from God forever. But thank God that one that rose from the grave, God in the flesh, loved us all. And you know what? I just really love the way the Bible reveals in so many different ways who Jesus is. For all different kinds of people. For instance, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the bread of life. Have you, anybody read that in the Bible? Christ is the bread of life. So now think about it. Even bakers can understand who Jesus is. The Bible says that Christ is the living water. Plumbers can even understand who Jesus is. The Bible says that he's the light of the world. Electricians can understand who Jesus is. The Bible says that he is the cornerstone. Architects and engineers and bricklayers can understand who Jesus is. The Bible says that he is the life of Biologists can understand who Jesus is. The Bible says that Christ is the healer. Doctors and nurses can understand who Jesus is. The Bible says he is the advocate. Lawyers can know who Jesus is. The Bible says that he is the teacher. Teachers and educators can know who Jesus is. The Bible says he is the rock of ages. Geologists can understand who Jesus is. The Bible says that he's the righteous one. Judges can understand who he is. The Bible says he's the wisdom of God. So philosophers can understand who Jesus is. You know, it just goes on and on. The Bible says he's the good shepherd. So farmers can understand who Jesus is. The Bible says he's the king of kings. Royalty can understand who Jesus is. The Bible says he's the way. Think of it, even traffic cops can understand who Jesus is. The Bible says he's the truth. Politicians can understand who Jesus is. The Bible says he's the resurrection. Funeral directors can understand who Jesus is. And the Bible just simply says that he's the savior of the whole world. And that means all of us can understand who Jesus is. Here's why I'm saying all of that. The one that rose from the dead 
desires to have a relationship with every person in this building today. And many of you have. Most of you probably have a relationship. But perhaps there are those who don't. And today would be an opportunity for you to receive him as the resurrected Lord. There are people who say, well, you know, okay, it's all right that you believe in Jesus Christ, but he's really not for me. I don't need that. Let me say to you, yes, you do. In fact, if you're here today, if you're living and breathing and you're human, then the Bible says that you, like me, are a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Therefore, everyone needs a Savior from their sin, and there's only one. No matter all the different religions that you look at across the world, my friend, there's only one Savior, and His name is Jesus Christ. Somebody might ask, but why would He want to save me? It's because of love. The love of God. Turn with me to the last verse I want you to see. Romans chapter 5. Great passage of scripture. Romans chapter 5 verses 8. Verse 8. Puts it so simply and so succinctly. Look what it says. Verse 8. Romans 5 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. I want you to notice the words. Kind of a big 10-gallon word there. But God commendeth. The word commendeth his love to us. What does that mean? Really, the, the, the word commendeth means to clearly state. Or it means to demonstrate. In fact, that's even a better word. You could put that word there and it would really fit. But God has demonstrated His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. Now here's the demonstration that Christ died for us. God demonstrated his love. God did not just, just just say that he loves us. He's proven that he loves us. He's demonstrated I've said this before, let me say it again. With every drop of blood that fell from the body of Jesus Christ and hit the ground, God was saying, I love you. I love you. I love you. All of us need to praise God today for the truth of that verse because the Bible tells us that God is a righteous and holy God. Therefore, He cannot just overlook sin your sin my sin all sin has to be dealt with and because God loves the whole world he dealt with sin through his son Jesus Christ and what happens then is it becomes the great exchange he who knew no sin became sin for us That we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Christ went to the cross and God the Father allowed Him to take the burden of all sin, your sin, my sin, past sin, yet future sins, all of it, funneled down on Jesus Christ. I'm absolutely convinced that it was the most difficult thing that Christ suffered on the cross. And in His body, and the beating and the rejection, and the spitting, and the slapping, and the swelling, and everything that he went through that the Bible brought him to. The Bible says he he came to a place that you couldn't even recognize who he was. That the physical was very, very difficult. But I'm persuaded the most difficult is that Jesus Christ became sin for us. Why? So that we that are sinners could then... Reach him through God's grace and through faith. And God would exchange our sin for his righteousness. And the day that I did this, and I really didn't quite understand the whole exchange of what took place that day in early 1974. 
when all by myself that I knelt down and I said, okay, Lord, I'm asking you, save me. But right then, God took all of my sins away. And he clothed me in the righteousness of his own son, Jesus Christ. And there's such power in that because not only did Jesus Christ die to make that possible, but he rose again on the third day to enforce it forever and forever and forever. And as a result, one day you and I will stand in the presence of Jesus Christ. We couldn't do it now. It would not be possible. We're still in our human flesh. We would hit our faces before the glory of God. But one day when we're changed from this mortal into immortality... And we take on the perfect body like unto Jesus Christ. We, the Bible says that we will see him face to face. And we will be compatible with him forever and forever and forever. And my friends, it's all because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You say, well, what, what would I need to do? If there's some person here today that has never received Christ as Savior, you would ask the question possibly, what do I need to do? Well, it really, it's a matter of done. The Lord did all the work. It's just a matter of, of saying yes to the Lord, realizing that it's by His grace, that if you will just turn away from your sins in your heart and your mind and be sorry for what your sin did to Christ on the cross, and then if you will then put your faith where God put your sin, which was on Jesus. And the Bible puts it succinctly in Romans chapter 10, verse number 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's what happened to me almost 50 years ago. But that's what can happen to you today. And it's just, he wants you to come just like you are. Many people think, well, I'm not ready. I've got to get my life straightened out a little bit. I've got to make myself presentable. Let me tell you what, that's not possible. You can't do it. In fact, God doesn't even want you to. He wants you to come to him just like you are. All the mistakes, all the sins, all the bad, all the lies. Anything that you can think that, that you've ever done, God wants you to bring it all to you just like you are and bring yourself before Him and just simply say to Him, Save me, Lord, just like you are. In fact, we're going to sing a song of invitation if you'll stand to your feet. And this song has been sung thousands of times in invitations in churches like this and Billy Graham crusades and places all over the world where the gospel has been presented and invitations have been given. It's the old song, Just As I Am. And as the musicians begin to play, we're going to pray that the Lord would touch somebody's heart today and God would draw them to himself understanding that Jesus Christ is real and that he rose from the, from the grave and that he's alive today on the right hand of the Father and he sees you and he's ready to take you as his child if you will just simply believe with all of your heart as your Savior we're going to sing the first verse of Just As I Am. And if you need to come, we pray that you will. And we'll show you exactly. We'll pray with you on how to be saved. Verse number one. Just as I am.
2. Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot to thee whose blood may say today, well, Pastor Gordon, you kicked both of those Easter lilies over. Why did you do that? I did that on purpose to demonstrate that all of us are going to kick the bucket. We're all going to die. You know, that's really true. We're all going to. The Bible calls that the final enemy that God will defeat. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 goes through many, many verses of Scripture teaching us about the resurrection and that, and that Christ is not risen, then we are men most miserable and still in our sins. But because He is risen, it changes everything. And salvation today has been made available for every person on planet Earth. And one of the greatest tragedies that will ever take place is for you to know it, but then not to avail yourself of faith in Jesus Christ. We're going to sing one more verse. If you need to come, please come as we sing right now. Just as I am, though tossed about with many a Aren't you glad that you came to Christ all those years ago? Me too. You know, we always say this, and we need to say it again, that the end of the invitation right now, technically in the building, is not over. It's still open for you. Do you know that invitation will not end until Christ comes? Let me help you to explain, help you to understand that. There are people today, perhaps in this building and other places in the world, that are hearing the gospel this Sunday in a church or in a ministry someplace that's being presented to them. And perhaps they reject and they don't receive Jesus Christ as Savior. When Jesus Christ comes in the rapture and he takes his people to heaven, according to the book of Thessalonians, those that have received an opportunity to be saved but rejected it will never have an opportunity to know the Lord. Now, yes, there will be many people saved in the tribulation period, but not those that have received an opportunity and then rejected Christ. The Bible says that they will believe a lie, the lie of the Antichrist. Somebody might ask them, well, when is Christ going to come? We don't know. We don't know. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be next week. It could be two years from now. We don't know when Christ is going to come. You know what that dictates to us? That today is the day of salvation because you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. So listen, precious one, that if you don't know the Lord, don't wait. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. And even after we leave the auditorium, if you need to come and talk, we will do so. But thank you so much for being here today. 
Matthew's going to come lead us in a song. Uh, in fact, as he's coming, uh, tonight's message, I'm going to be speaking again tonight. Here's the title, The Battle for the Bible. Do you know the Bible is being attacked today like never before in terms of its, uh, its inspiration and it being the Word of God. And I want to talk to you about that battle that's going on for the Bible from the Scripture. We're going to do that tonight. Matthew, you come lead us in a song. Ruth and I will be in the back. Let's sing, Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord, He is holy and just. By His power we trust in His love. Great is the Lord, He is faithful and true. By His mercy He proves He is love. Great is the Dismissed.